18 and we're supposed to have 25. So I'm thinking many, many people will be looking at the recording later. All right, so hello, or as my Star Wars fan son says, hello there. Um, today we'll be <laughs> talking about how to give a presentation, how to avoid giving a bad presentation and tips on making a really good one. So whether you're going to be giving a talk at the workshop, at the Mosaics workshop, or a presentation on a poster, um, or even reporting back with your staff at the end of the internship, some of the DHAs, it's, it's a requirement. So this is part of, of what you'll need to do. So the skills for giving a good talk will be very, very useful now and in the future. And um, for this presentation, while well, I relied heavily on a work by Michael Alley at Penn State University, um, he has produced a model called the Assertion Evidence Model for giving talks. So if you're an undergrad student, grad student, you will have experienced, um, you have experienced lectures and talks in class and um, both good and bad. So that's my first question. No doubt some, presenter, some presenters were dismal and hard to follow. So while others were you know, great and you will say, I had the best professor in physics, <laughs> but you know, they got their point across. So the question is what makes the difference? So to start off, I'd like you to think back to a lecture that could have been delivered more effectively. Um, I'll open the chat window, Chanel will help me with that, and list one problem that comes to mind with past presentations that you have seen, and this could be a problem with the slide, the delivery, um, anything that you want to mention from, from that bad presentation. Okay, we have too many words on the slide, seems unrehearsed, ah. monotone voice speaking too fast, not engaging the audience, being quiet, meandering with no discernible point. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I, I, I sometimes do that too. It's some, you just go off. Um, those are really good. I wanna point out that you said too, mi too much text on the slide and then go back to a PowerPoint that, that you've done did you make that same mistake? Because it's just a classic mistake. Um, animations on a slide are also a bad idea. <laughs> really, really distracting animation. So um, yeah, those are really good points. And as a professor myself, I can honestly say that I've made so many of those in 17 years in the classroom that I don't care to name them all, but yes, these are mistakes that we are learning from. And now we know what works and what does not work. So going to my next slide here, <laughs> this slide for learning. Here's an example that presents some difficulties if you're trying to learn content or remember um, a procedure like for the federal resumes. <laughs> well, this slide, um, you might ask yourself, what am I supposed to take away from this? Um, does the speaker think I'm gonna know what a bisopelagic zone is without an image or maybe a diagram? Um, how am I supposed to read and listen to the person at the same time? That's the biggie. You can't do it. It can't be done. Um, how you know? I'm just getting dizzy from from the visual chaos. So what you'll eventually do with a slide like this is just immerse yourself in the water and forget about the class or the presentation. That's what any of us would do, right? So we need to avoid these, these images, the lot of text, the, these texts without diagrams that you need. So this is what we're gonna talk about today. We've seen these presentations over and over. Now you're supposed to give a scientific talk and usually this has a structure. We've all seen these in conferences and um, classrooms, people defending their dissertations. <laughs> this is the way to go, right? This is the professional way that we've known so far. So it's the topic, the authors, what's it about? 
Um, how are you doing it? The methods? What did you find out with the results? What's next? Future steps? Some people put limitations in there. Who helped? And a thank you. But you need to know mm -hmm. who is your audience. And when we're in a scientific presentation, um, your audience may be people that know about your topic, but then you have in the mix people that have no idea what you're talking about. So you may need to define words, never use acronyms. Um, and I don't, we'll go over those. So of course, um, when you explain what the project is about, I think the topic and the author, you do what we did today, right now, um, Chanel introduced, this is the webinar. Child is presenting and I go into what is the motivation of this? Well, you need to know this because you're gonna present at a workshop. So that's our motivation today. But when you present your research, what you did over the summer, you want that motivation to anybody notice your passion for your work. So you need to go into that motivation. You may wanna present the, um, the big, the big holistic problem of, of science, why you're doing that in the first place, why the park is doing it. So that's a biggie, the motivation. Then you go into the methods. Um, when you go into the methods, uh, you know, you, you want to go into some detail as to we can follow what you did and how you did it, but you don't want to go into the nitty gritty details of, you know, and I, this is even the workflows that I use, unless it's very, very important for you to, for, for us to know that 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 was part of what you needed to do. So um, to finalize with the never forget the acknowledgements, uh, the acknowledgements are maybe deciding if you get a future presentation at that conference or at that, <laughs> with that audience. So one of the things that you don't wanna skip ever are the, the thank yous. Okay, so like I said, big Star Wars fan. Um, <clears throat> and your research, your presentation, we've all been told that there's a, there's a, a, a workflow to it. Well, I want to present what the guy, Mar uh, Michael Alley was telling us in his research. He found that people love a story. And so when you present your research, you might want to use that story. You can use the arc. Um, to convey your science story. So let's take Star Wars for an example, uh, A New Hope here, Luke, <laughs> a farm boy, and he just purchases two droids and with valuable information and that's your exposition of the problem. The evil empire strikes back. Uh, well, the evil empire um, tracks down the droids, killing Luke's family, forcing Luke to flee. That's the inciting incident. And in your case, that would be your motivation of why you're doing the research. Fleeing the empire's grasp with the help of friends, <laughs> Luke gets captured in um, the Death Star, forcing him to find a temporary disable the mighty battle station. During an escape, he saves Princess Leia. And departing for a hidden, hidden rebel base rising action. Then the empire tracks Luke and Leia, shows up at the rebel base, <laughs> threatened to blow it up with the Death Star, planetary laser cannon, that's your crisis. After the daring assault, Luke manages to use the information hidden in the joys to destroy the Death Star, the climax of the whole story. Striking down the evil empire, saving the rebel alliance, that's the denouement. And Luke and his new friends celebrate as heroes. The end, that's the new normal. So you can make it simple. You don't have to make it too detailed. Like you don't, we don't have to go into how Luke was, you know, drinking milk. He was a whiny farm boy. He was always complaining. And even though it's true, but we don't have to go into details. We don't have to go into the names of the droids. You, you wanna keep your story simple but you need in science, the introduction is your background. Um, the reason why this work is interesting and important to do is going to be your inciting incident, um, the observation that made it all happen. You can ask your supervisors, 
because some of you are doing research that's new, but some of you are doing research, are continuing research that started 10 years ago, um, 15 years ago. Why did that research start in the first place? Why is it still relevant? Why is it still happening? And you're an important piece of that. <clears throat> the rising action could be the process of des designing the project sampling procedure, data collection, or model development. Some of you are doing that just now. Some of you were hired. The park needed somebody with new skills to do model development. So that right there is going to be your rising action. And um, the climax is going to be for, for us, the data analysis, the model output production, uh, the start of the interpretation. So finishing the data or model output and possible explanations is, is gonna be, um, and looking forward to the next steps is gonna be the your wrap up, your end. You have, uh, I think it was eight to 10 minutes to present your work. So you need to make it relevant, exciting, and that people, your audience enjoys what you did and you know wish they could have been there with you doing that research because it was so, interesting and so important and and you you know you made it sound very fun so that's that's the importance of delivering a good good um story if you don't like the story or the star wars mm -hmm. then we do have an option <laughs> it's called the ocar and and the ocar is and this is something i'm borrowing from the book writing science um where it says your research is the story they still go with the we're still we're still trying to, to explain to people that science, you know, we don't want to deliver a boring research. We're doing something that's meaningful and we want people to love what we're doing and, and possibly join in. There are, um, there's the opening, what's it about, who, who participated, um, what's the problem you're addressing. So that's your introduction, your opening, your challenge, what do your characters need to accomplish? What specific questions do you propose to answer? So that question in science, you know how some of our mentors will say, well, the question is everything. If you don't have a question, where are you going? That's where you start with a question. That's your challenge. That's the biggest challenge. So what the action, um, what happens to address the challenge? In the paper, you describe what worked, um, what, what you hope to accomplish. That's kind of like the proposal. And then the resolution, um, what are your results and discussion? And of course, uh, this, like I said, this has to be an overview of what you had as results, an overview of what you think is gonna happen with what you discovered, your findings or what's you know next in your research. So, and it, and it has to come back to its starting point. So that's why there's the, the arrow that circles. So like I said, these are the typical titles of slides in a scientific talk, but um, the assertion evidence research indicates that these headings just miss the opportunity for, for conveying a point, a message. So what, what, do you want, um, what do you want from that? You want to keep it simple with the images, keep it simple with just a heading, the idea is to make your heading a statement that conveys the single most important point of this part of your talk. So we're gonna avoid the bullets. We're gonna avoid these sentences. I'm sure you remember there was a, a rule of thumb. If it was six items by four, you were safe, not too much text. Well, that has been blown to pieces. That is not the the case anymore. The case is, and what research has shown, is that the heading conveying a message is much, makes much more of an impact for your story. The images are going to um, be of value to, to what you're saying, and the presentation is going to be you, what you're saying and how you're saying it. So here, the heading. Um, it could be about the results. It could be um, it, it could be about 
the important, an important point, like in this one, uh, if you let's reduce leading edge vortices in nature and engineering. So we have an example of the shark, how nature, we're using nature to inspire engineering. And that's the takeaway. That's, that's what you want people to know about what you were doing. Maybe not you. So there's a video on build talks on messages, not topics. I'm not going to show it now, um, but I'm leaving you with with the link. Oh, when I share this slide with the slides, you're going to be able to go into the link. So here's a slide, <laughs> an old slide. I'm not going to say it's a slide that I use. Um, when I was talking about birds to people that didn't know anything about birds, and here I was with this slide. If you want to just go in the chat box and comment, if you will, I'm not going to look because I get very emotional with this with this slide because I used to use it a lot. But see how I just wanted to present birds to people and I would say, well, they have wings and hollow bones and their feet. Evolution has been wonderful with them. But they were reading and they were looking at the little pictures and I lost many of them, especially because there were a lot of little kids here. But then I changed this slide and I made it better. The statement, a question, what makes a bird a bird? Well, wings, they can fly. They can do something that we mammals cannot. They have feathers for this. Wonderful, beautifully, colorful, and many, many birds feathers. They also have hollow bones that makes it possible to fly because of their weight. They also have very distinctive and very helpful types of feet. And for this, I would be, uh, elaborate. The beaks for what type of food that they eat. And I go on about beaks. And of course, their beautiful anatomy. <laughs> So that compared to the first slide, that information there was exactly what I had in the first slide in a more impactful and meaningful slide. And it was just one slide with, like I said, it's not animations, it's transitions. I was trying to get the attention for each one of the factors that made a bird a bird. And it was much more easier to understand. So that was um, one of my uh, improvements when I started reading about how to do a presentation, because like I said, it's, it's been quite a while since I've been doing presentations. So then I came across something like this and I thought, yeah, that works. No text, I can say anything I want. Is that a problem? What's missing here? Let's see. What do you think is missing? Someone oh, I'll wait in the chat box. Context. What, what? Someone said a header. Oh my gosh. Context. The context. Yep. The context. Let me just give it right here. We always want to say at least who, where, when, what something in, in those lines. What is this? Bird petroglyph on sandstone. Who took the picture? M.A. Lothian. Where? Legend rock petroglyph site in Utah. You don't wanna keep your public guessing or going into Google and trying to get the information that you should have provided. So yes, these type of images are wonderful. You just, Think of the moment each time we go into our chat and one of the turtle people has sent a turtle picture. And of course they have to say, you know, what is it? Where was it found? And what are the circumstances that that one was dead, right? And the context, you don't want people guessing or um, trying to find out the information that you need to provide to them. So yes, photographs are a really, really great way. And like I said, the you can use the message, the heading, not the heading, the topic, 
but that statement of uh, what's relevant, what's important, don't leave that out um, unless you are making the statement here. So again, going back to, and I wanna reinforce this because <laughs> I give this presentation early in the semester and I tell the students, you have a presentation at the end of the semester and it's like, they don't trust what we said in the beginning and they go with the bullets and they go with the tiny images. And I'm going, where did I go wrong? Maybe I didn't present enough evidence of the research that I'm using. So again, I stuck it in here, um, a little bit of evidence again by Michael Alley at Penn State. <laughs> Maybe then you can believe me. So what he was doing is comparing two classes who were taught using the traditional method and the assertion evidence model of the slides. The second group was able to recall things more successfully. No surprise there because look at this example on the left. We don't know which point we should take away from the slide, all of them. And on the right, we know which point to take away. The photo is linked to a map that fleshes it out in our minds and imaginations. So <clears throat> the group on the left could 59% of the group on the left could recall after studying. 77% of their group could recall after studying uh, the slide on the right. So we want to emulate this. We would, we would want to put that, that um, statement on the top, the images, maps, not too many. Let's go to the next one. Oh, and I included the p-value right there. So you can believe me, believe the science and believe the numbers. All right. Like I was saying in the beginning, the right parallel processor in our brain cannot handle spoken words and written words at once, either or. So either you read or you listen, you cannot do both. And I took the liberty of, this is an actual photo of a workshop. <laughs> Look at this slide they were presenting here in the back. Yeah, yes, yes. I don't see their eyes open because we cannot, we either listen or we read. We cannot do both at the same time. So because we process images um, in a different part of the brain and we need to listen. So what we're suggesting is uh, oops, use the images, the statement, and you will be uh, talking. You will be the presentation como tal. In, in itself, common mistakes. I'm not gonna read it, but the mistakes. So there are common there, too much text, the heading, the topic heading, too many images, and even using those colors. So having a phrase rather than a statement, using red, uh, red fonts, a big no-no, too cluttered, too many figures, graphs are unreadable. Um, you need to use fewer images, larger images, uh, less text, avoid red and green fonts. And I've had dyslexic students that haven't said anything until the end of the semester. They missed half, you know, they used to, it used to be that they, they would miss half of the lectures and not say anything. But now they're speaking up. Now, they're, now I had one this semester that said, ah, you need to, everything that's red and green, you need to point it out to me, please. And I did. So, See how I put all that that people tend to put every word because you're gonna have to memorize your presentation to give it to present it. Um, what are your options if you cannot put your bullet points on the slide? I have little cards where I've put my presentation. You see me, I've, I've been looking at my cards because I want to follow the script, I don't want to go off script talking about birds. And <laughs> I have my little cards and I look at them and I come back to you and I look at them. I haven't missed anything. I said everything. I'll go back to you and I'll keep going. So because bullets are not memorable for you 
or for your audience. They don't show a connection and you have your PowerPoint there without the complete um, sentences. And you're wondering, what was I gonna say about that bullet? So you might wanna have your flashcards and do this type of slide with the flow. So we did this um, usually for the methods. You, you're not gonna put methods up there. You're just gonna say, you know, this is the workflow of the procedure, or you can you can say, this is how we resolved this question or answered this question. And you go part by part, you see what I said. At the very least, um, the viewer doesn't need to understand the details of each of, of each image, but they will understand the sequence in this process, which is what you need us to do. Their eyes can follow the flow of the diagrams while the speaker describes it using words. The annotations on the slide help both to know what each picture represents and what comes next. So every time you have a bullet list, you can make that list into uh, a, a workflow or figures or this type of image. I love maps. So I'll have a map in every workflow that I do. <clears throat> Going into, um, if, if you're like me, if, you know, this person that needs to know, but how many slides, how much time in each slide should I spend? It's, it's really up to you. I always present this slide saying, okay, the rule of thumb is to use one slide per minute but you're not gonna spend one slide introducing yourself, not really, that should take 30 seconds. But in the one slide that you may wanna take a little bit more time is in the introduction motivation. You always wanna put that history in there, uh, the park history, the park, um, why the park started this project in the first place and maybe a timeline of when it started and when you got there and how you made it better or what your contribution was. So there you can spend a little more than 30 seconds and a little more than a minute. And then you can go into the minute slides with a method, you know, describe the method in a worthy detail that we can all understand what you did and how you did it and where you did it, but always using the images, always using images, no bullets, no words. Look at all the blue um, rectangles. Those are indicators of images. So you wanna put your, um, <clears throat> your statements and your image, and then you talk about the, the, this is what we did, and this is the animal we're tracking. Um, this is the plant we're studying, Sasha. And you put an image and you let us know exactly what you were looking at when you were in the field doing that. And for the only thing that you need the, the workflow is for this type of, of explanation. So figures, plots, like I said, um, you will discuss all the figures, very clear pictures that are uh, clear, big, and easy to see, easy to understand. You need to practice your talk. If your talk is supposed to be a 10 minute talk, you need to practice it at least five times. And the recommended um, practice time is 50 minutes if it's a 10 minute talk for it to come out fluid. And one of the recommendations that I've given out since I did it, um, but for, for a longer presentation, a 45 minute presentation, I recorded it in my, in my phone and I used to listen to it first until I memorized it. And then I would go with the phone on, looking at the presentation and, and also saying it with my script, my written script on the side until I didn't have to look at the script anymore, until I could pause and not listen to the recording anymore, until it was just flowing out because I had practiced it so many times. That's how important it was, right? You wanna graduate? So, don't use too many slides. Don't do this. This is what I did here. This is for other purposes. This, I'm not giving a presentation on anything. So 
Um, I'm not giving a presentation on a topic. I shouldn't say it like that. Don't do this type of slide. Um, bullet points like this, crowded slides, digress from the story. You need to use your statements as headings, have a message per slide. Those messages, I like I said, I suggest you go um, now that it's you're starting your project, today is June 7th, you will go out to the field now knowing, wait, that is a great uh, photo for my presentation for when I talk about methods. Oh, let me take a picture of the crew because I wanna say that I was working with a crew. And you're, now you're gonna be go out aware of what you need for your presentation. And that's a lot of images, right? And what types of messages are important? Sometimes when you're out in the field, um, uh, your mentor, your supervisor, somebody that's working directly with you will say, will say something that will resonate and you say that's important for everybody to know about this project. And that's what you're gonna put in there. And like I said, um, minimize your text if you have and your slides, you don't wanna do one, more than one slide um, per minute. All right, and for those of you that need to do your poster presentation, if you wanna do both, you can do both. I love students that do both, the PowerPoint and the poster, you know, just <laughs> get invited to speak at a conference. Um, for those, for the posters, usually the, the organization that's hosting the event will say, okay, we would prefer if it was a horizontal, horizontal or vertical poster. And you'll get instructions on size because they will provide easels or they'll have they'll have the boards where you can you can put your poster. So those they will have a size limit. And usually the instructions will be given to you when you're when you're gonna do your poster. We do have a template. So we have a template for posters. We give you the slide. It has, if you print it out, it has a certain size. So we give you the template and you will just not do this. Right? You're looking at these going, are they for real? Yeah, 100%. Got them off the internet. So <clears throat> what to avoid in a poster? So the poster is actually more difficult than a, um, than a PowerPoint or a Prezi, because in the posters, you need to be so succinct with your text. <laughs> and that is a skill, my friends, that you develop. It's not easy. I'm not there yet, I can assure you. Uh, but you do your best, right? And because we, like I'm saying, we provide a template, the template has, and I'll put it out here, your introduction, uh, you can have your background, your just justification, your results, a lot of images, and of course your acknowledgements and your references. We want anybody that, that stands in front of your poster to look at your poster and say, they did this in this area and look at what they found, amazing. Not a lot of people will read all the text in your poster. But if, if anybody reads it, they should be able to know what, where, when in five minutes. If you're there to present it, then they're in for a treat because they can ask you the questions and um, you know go in depth with you. So that's what we're looking for with the poster. Estefania Vicente was, was one of the mosaics in 2019 who presented uh, orally in, in the workshop. And then she got invited to the GSA meeting and she presented the poster. And of course, uh, the program manager for that year and 2020, Lima Soto was there at the conference. She's also a geologist and, and loved the poster, but she used the template. <laughs> template, so that was great. I know a little bit of what I'm talking about because I also love to present posters in meetings. I'm kind of shy for those um, presentations that are with the people. So I just leave the poster there and I start eating beside the poster. If anybody's interested, I'll come up and say, any questions? And if I feel too bombarded, then I'll go back and 
just hide again and eat a little bit more. So that's why I love posters. So what you're gonna do now is draft, <laughs> draft your talk in <laughs> four or five minutes. What are you doing? How are you doing it? And who you're doing it with and where? Just jot down in a piece of paper what you're doing. I'm gonna put a little timer here. I'm just gonna give you two minutes while I go in the chat. See if there are any questions specifically. Good question, Jalen. Work on your draft. I'm just joking. Um, yes, actually. And I'll say who's presenting after I finish this. We'll talk about that, definitely. So the reason that you're doing this draft right now is just to, when you sit when you sit down and do your draft, that's when questions come up. So if you do the exercise, questions will arise. Wait, what do I include here? And that's what we're trying to get from you now. We're almost at the end of the presentation. So Devante, <clears throat> put a title to your presentation about what you're doing this summer um, and draft an intro sentence, a method sentence, but you're gonna do statements later on with those drafts, right? And when you draft your um, results statement, it's going to be hypothetical. You still don't have results yet and conclusions, nothing yet. And in your mind, you will start noticing that ideas will come to you about the image that you need to put in your introduction for us to understand what you're doing, which is it. Depends on what your statement is. So draft that, draft your methods in a statement what image goes with that or images and of course all of you should have thought of putting a map of your park in the introduction because i know where you are for example i know where guam is i don't know where the park is in Guam, right? You guys know that I live in Puerto Rico, but you guys don't know that I live in the center of the mountains, high on top of a mountain of Puerto Rico, which is beautiful. But a lot of you would think, huh, San Juan, the capital, no, no, not this city. That's why maps are so important because they will place you and your audience um, to where they need to be. All right, two minutes are up. What are you gonna do? <laughs> Your first draft of PowerPoint are due or posters are due on Wednesday, July 21st. And you need to schedule a practice session. So for practice sessions and my light just went a little bit dark here. So for practice sessions, we can do, I, I went to Texas to see Jalen and Cynthia and Jalen has to present her presentation to her staff, to her crew, the lab there, the turtle lab crew. And I said, hey, so when you present to your crew, 
I can be zoomed in. That's so funny. I could zoom in with, with one of the phones or a tablet and I could look at the presentation. I could listen to the presentation. So the, the best thing would be that you present to your crew first, to your working crew, because they will tell you, hey, present this about the park. This is really important that you say this about the park or the project. Your supervisor is gonna tell you, um, oh, that image cannot go there. It's privileged information. Maybe another <laughs> image would be nice and they'll give you an image that's appropriate and it can, can go out to the public. Um, your crew can also say, hey, maybe you can emphasize on this or explain a little bit on this. My, my work in the practice session is just to see how you're delivering, if the format is correct, if I can understand what you're saying and anything presentation wise, but not content wise. So my job is to make sure that anybody that sees your presentation understands you and that you're comfortable giving it. But your NPS crew is there to tell you what's the best information for you to put in the presentation. And, oh, I was gonna say something else. Um, maybe for some presentations for the public between, between NPS and Mosaics and um, us, there's no problem if if you're you know holding the turtle, but then that's not the same case for everybody. There's many people that can say that's animal harassment or they don't understand the laws or they don't know the laws that it says that you have a permit because you're a researcher. So what what we usually usually do is we don't put all all the photos of us handling animals in, in a presentation. We might put one where we already released the animal um, or maybe near it, but not maybe holding it. So all of these little things are what I'll be looking for, your supervisor might be looking for. So these practice sessions are very, very important for you and Environment for the Americas. And of course, your park you're representing your whole summer work in this presentation. The final PowerPoint is due Wednesday, July 28th. And um, you will have, uh, you will have <coughs> space for your acknowledgements. There's, um, there's a link for, for one of the videos of where I got much of the information, the research done on how to do a presentation there. And your thank yous. Hmm. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, I'll go into the announcement in exactly a minute, but let's get